Good morning. Welcome to the OB Division Lifetime Achievement Award. I'm Mary Yulbeen. I'm the, the former past division chair of the division. And I'm really excited to be here and in, introduce the Lifetime Achievement Award winner, Fred Luthans. I worked with Fred at Nebraska. He's been a fabulous colleague. I was very excited to see him earn this. I think it's extremely well deserved. The Lifetime Achievement Award, as you know, is given for the scholar who makes a distinguished contribution to the profession over the career. Uh, the contribution is in terms of academic contribution and a scholarly record. I think we all know that Fred has achieved on that. I think he's been what we would call in the old days a rate buster. Working with him, I know that he was a rate buster. He also has made a contribution in terms of mentoring students. He has mentored many, many students, as we described in the introduction of him, and I think Eva will talk about this a little bit more. And he has given to the profession, so service. Fred, when I got to be OB division chair, he was president of the academy. He was an early president. And he said, you know, the OB division is now bigger than the academy was when I was president. So he was one of the people who really helped get this organization going, up and running, to what we, what we see today, an amazing organization. So with that, I want to turn it over to Ivana Milosevic. She's a student, a former student from Nebraska, a student of Fred's, and she's going to give us an introduction. Thank you. Thank you, Mary, so much. Well, good morning. Um, it is my honor to introduce Dr. Fred Lutens this morning. His prominent contribution to academy through research and service uh, is without comparison. Fred has contributed, and I need to make sure that I have this right, over a dozen major books and over 200 published articles throughout his career. His citation count is equally impressive. Fred's work has been cited 52,500 times, according to Google Scholar. I don't know that there are many people with that <laughs> record. Bolio has 92,000, so I can Oh, sorry. <laughs> I should have known that. Um, however, what I would like to emphasize very briefly uh, this morning is the impact that Fred had through his dedication to young scholar development. Interestingly, uh, I've, I had a really amazing cohort in uh, Nebraska. We were in our PhD program, and they were all helping me prepare for this moment. And we did some research. And I don't know if, Fred, do you know this? But we discovered that Fred's first PhD student graduated at least four years before any of us was born. Okay. This, that is over 40 years of students that are productive members, members of the academy and professors at the most prestigious universities around the world. What a legacy. My cohort is tremendously grateful for the guidance, support, knowledge, and frequent laughter, you know, he makes really good jokes, we experienced during our doctoral program. And today, as we are pursuing our academic careers all over the world, we all know that he's always just one quick email away. Seriously, I'm yet to meet somebody who responds to emails faster than Fred. Half an hour, maybe. Okay. His research, his service to the academy, and above all, his dedication to his students is immeasurable. There is no one more deserving of this award. Congratulations, Dr. Lutens. We are all very proud of you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Love it. Thank you. I'm going to try to move around a little bit. I don't think you could take me behind this podium for the next hour almost. So I'm going to move around, and they said they could catch me on the camera back there, so I'll do that. But anyway, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you today and talk about something that's very passionate to me, and that is this whole notion of psychological capital, or as the title says, the search for positivity in the workplace and beyond. And I'll get at the end there, the beyond part. 
So thank you so much for getting here this morning. I know this is not an ideal time slot, so I really appreciate the, that you made it here this morning. Now, what I'm going to do today is hopefully give you a, the, the big picture rather than get into individual studies and things like that. But before I do, as you can tell, with people like Ivana helping me through, along the way, I had uh, Lyman Porter and Gary Latham nominate me uh, maybe six years ago on this award. <laughs> I didn't get it. So uh, Ivana and her cohorts, most of which are here today, they said, Fred, we want to nominate you. I said, no, I don't want to do that again. I've you know, been there, done that. I'm not going to have that nomination. So they did it anyway. <laughs> and of course, you know, Lyman was a dear friend and to many of you as well. And I thought, oh, you know, that, that'll be the best, best possible nomination I could get, right? Well, not as good as my students, I guess. So anyway, thank you. Now I'm going to start off by giving you a little pictorial overview here of some of the highlights of my career. And of course, uh, I started off at the University of Nebraska, excuse me, the University of Iowa. And uh, gee, I look pretty thin there at least. Uh, and I was on the track team. Um, then I immediately, as, upon graduation with all, all my degrees at Iowa, including the PhD, I had a report into the military because that was the buildup of the Vietnam War in 1965. So I had to go in, and I was lucky to go through ROTC to get my commission. And I ended up, believe it or not, teaching leadership and psychology at West Point. So what a, what a break I got, because all my classmates at Fort Benning, Georgia, went through the infantry training. Uh, I went to West Point, they went to Vietnam, and of course a lot of them didn't come back. So I always say my education probably saved my life, actually. And then I went, of course, to Nebraska for my whole career, including since I've been retired for two years now, but I still teach once in a while. So I've been there at Nebraska for 50 years, so obviously that says something about something. I'm not sure. <laughs> but those are some of my students that you may recognize back there. I, actually, I see Ivana back there on the back row, I believe. <laughs> And then, of course, another thing that I really feel that I've done is go around the world. And that's been mainly through my department chair for so many years, Song Lee, who really got me going, you know, an Iowa boy going through uh, the world after that. And uh, I literally have been almost to every country in the world. And uh, this happened to be on TV in South Africa. And then the next one there, consulting with China Mobile in, uh, in China on SICAP. That particular uh, company, China, Momo, China Mobile, they have 500,000 employees, you know, <laughs> typical China size, right? <laughs> as big as some small countries. But anyway, we're talking there, and that's going over all their satellite feed across the China. And then I'll tell you at the end of my talk here today, too, now I'm kind of moving the beyond part in taking PSYCAP to places like Harvard Medical School, where the last two years I've been lecturing on PSYCAP, first on concussions and now on oncology, and I'll tell you about that at the end. But most of all, I'm proud of my family, and uh, there they are, a few blondes in there. <laughs> and of course, in the middle there is myself and my wife of 54 years, I think that's right, Kay, right? 54 years, <clears throat> and so I'm very proud of all of them, and next to, next to them on uh, your right is Brett, who's here today, Professor Brett Luthans. He's here today, and then my, the big tall guy there, he's uh, Professor Kyle Luthans, so we're together in a lot of papers even. And then the others, I'm just equally proud of all of them there. And uh, you can see our nice lakes we have in Nebraska. <laughs> no, <laughs> that's the North Shore of Oahu. <laughs> but anyway, uh, that's uh, the most important to me all, all through my career. But here's the crown jewel there. 
He's the eighth grandchild. His name is Tyler, so he's, uh, he's quite a guy. He doesn't get spoiled at all. So <laughs> Anyway, he wasn't born when this picture was snapped. Now, the major careers, I've broken down my career into four major phases. The first one being organizational behavior. And organizational behavior, I feel I was on the you know, ground floor of that. certainly didn't discover it or anything like that. But I certainly was on the ground floor of the whole field of OB. And uh, that started in, as soon as I hit Nebraska, we didn't have a course in OB. So I had the first course in OB. I didn't have an OB course at the University of Iowa when I was you know, getting my PhD. So it was a new field just kind of coming out. And uh, I was uh, on the ground floor of that. Of course, I feel Lyman was <laughs> the father of OB, in my field at least, of OB. And uh, that's, you know, he's before me, of course, but I, I like to think that was one phase of my career, just the whole OB field. Then I did kind of branch out into what I called OB mod, organizational behavior modification, and had, you know, articles then and branded that in 1971 and then had a book on that in 1975, actually. And then people don't know about this one, although a few do, and the people who know about it always like it a lot. But I kind of got caught in a publishing game there and never did get that out on the, uh, some qualitative studies on real managers. What do managers really do? And then finally, of course, now talking about positive organizational behavior and what I'll spend most of the time on with you today, psychological capital that I then carved out in the last, you know, 15 to 17 years here. Now, my career strategy, and I did believe it or not, and I think this is something that the younger uh, scholars here should know, I had a strategy of how I wanted to do my career. And that strategy was to take a new concept uh, and actually coin the term, which if you look in Google, there's nobody that's talked about positive organizational behavior. Nobody mentioned, now there's positive organizational scholarship, but that came out in the literature actually a little bit later. And then we do have, of course, uh, some, you know, some other kinds of, you know, closely related, but I actually coined the term psychological capital as well, at least in the title of any kind of article. And I always kept it quite broad. I think one of the problems that I see, especially looking through our journals, people get so narrow that nobody really knows <laughs> what they're talking about except the very few handful, almost, scholars that are in that particular same you know, track of research. So I kept quite broad, as you can tell, by the four that I just went through. And then I also had a strategy of not trying to build the theory. You know, one of the mistakes I think, like doctoral students always make, oh, I'm going to get two, two publications out of my dissertation, one on theory and one on research. Good luck on that theory part. <laughs> Very difficult to get theory published, as you all know. So my strategy was to take established theories and then build off of those. So, for example, in OB, I've already mentioned Lyman, but also Chris Ardress. I had the opportunity to listen to Chris when I was at West Point. He came down and gave a talk at Arden House, uh, Columbia University, that brought him in. At that time, he was at Yale. And, and I listened to Chris, and I thought, wow, this kind of is a cool way to conceptualize the field of organizational behavior, what he was talking about there. So I was lucky to have that. And then, of course, I eventually got into Bandura with social cognitive theory. So that became my theory. And then the same was true for OB Mod. I just took Skinnerian behaviorism that I had a couple of courses at Iowa. Now we're looking at you know, where Al Bandura's from. He's from Iowa too, as is Mark Martinkle's master's degree, but not his PhD from me. But anyway, Bandura had the same program I had in the psychology department only a, you know, 10 years earlier. But some of the same professors he had, I had. So, of course, I had that kind of background, too. <clears throat> and then, of course, the real managers, I really kind of took off what Henry Mitzberg, of course, we all know his contributions in the strategy field, but Henry also did the famous book on the nature of managerial work. And, wow, that was a great study of 
six managers. <laughs> I wasn't quite willing to generalize what managers do on the basis of his six manager study that were friends of his father's up in Canada. And, uh, but he did a very intensive, great study on, you know, qualitative study. And I use that kind of as a takeoff for that real manager's work that I did in the 80s. And then, of course, I had the opportunity to do uh, positive psychology from the beginning. And I say the beginning. I wasn't at Seligman's talk at the APA, but I was at the first summit of positive psychology in Lincoln, Nebraska. <laughs> Why Lincoln? Because that's where Gallup was. Why was I there? Because I worked for Gallup as a senior research scientist for 20 years, but I was there in 1999 at the first summit of positive psychology, and I'm thinking, wow, this stuff really makes sense, and I haven't really seen it in our literature. So I made it really that aha moment there, and I said, I'm going to take positive psychology to the workplace. And who was I listening to? Martin Seligman, Barb Fredrickson, Ed Diener, Mike Cheek sent me high, all the gurus in positive psychology, and I'm saying, I'm going to take that to the workplace. So I made it my mission to do that. So anyway, I couldn't have done it, though, without this group of people, and I apologize because I just could put so many up here. But that starts with Bruce Avolio, of course, and uh, what a colleague he has been for me all through the years. And then just some of my more senior ones on the top row there. Diane Welsh, who's in entrepreneurship. Mark is here, done a great job at Florida State, now t uh, Florida A&M. And Mark, of course, has done a lot of work in attribution. Ken Thompson has been a great colleague of mine through the years. <laughs> and of course, ran the senior editor for the JLOS. But these two in the bottom here, Carolyn Youssef in the theory side, <laughs> wow, was I lucky to have her. She's just been a wonderful colleague of mine through the years and just a wonderful writer and theorist. And I just, you know, couldn't have done it without her. And the same for James Abey, a wonderful methodological and just great guy to work with through the years. And then the two younger ones here, Ivana on the right there and Lei Wong there, uh, who's uh, just, you know, he's at Auburn. And Ivana, of course, is the one who introduced me today. So I'm leaving out so many others, and I apologize for that. Some of you are here, but believe me, I, I, you all know that you're part of this too. Now, I think, again, another strategy I always had is to have the first book in each of these phases of my career. So in the case of uh, OB, I, that was 1973. You know, I even had Lyman say, well, you know, I had a book. No, no, I looked up your copyright, Lyman. It was 1976 when your book came out with, uh, with uh, Lawler. So Porter and Lawler had a textbook -y type of thing, but, of course, more of a contribution. In 68, they had an a OB text, uh, not a textbook, but an OB research book. And uh, so my 1973 textbook, then I had the book on organizational behavior modification, and then I had the book on real managers that dropped out of the publisher, went belly up, so I never really, really did get that out. But guess what? It's being redone right now as we speak. Bob Hogan thought it was a really great book, and he wanted to republish it. He said, yeah, go ahead. So we're republishing that book now. And then, of course, this one here, PsychCap, which Bruce, of course, played a big role in. And uh, this is the uh, second one. The first one came out in 2007. This one came out in 2015. So the PSYCAP book, which again hasn't been a huge bestseller by any means, but serves as the foundation for this whole field of positive organizational behavior. But this is the one I'm most proud of. That's now the 13th edition of the OB book in this reason here. <laughs> My two sons as co-authors, Brett here, who's sitting there, and Kyle there. So they're the two co-authors, so how proud am I of that, you know? So it's now Luthans, Luthans, and Luthans. <laughs> Can't get any better than that for Fred. <clears throat> now, the first positive approach, though, that I took in this search for positivity in the workplace was OB Mod. 
organizational behavior modification. And that actually came about because I was working in the mental health system in Nebraska, and the head of the mental health system was a psychiatrist, MD, and he said, Fred, you know, I'm out there doing MBO work, which Ken actually was one of the, uh, his dissertation, and, and he and I worked together a lot on in the old days of management by objectives, right? So I'm doing that in these mental health facilities, but this psychiatrist says, Fred, why don't you use some behavior modification techniques that we're finding very helpful in our clinical side of the house? I said, you know what? I don't know why we don't. So that was, again, that moment that mattered, as Bruce always says, that moment that mattered to me to light up my idea about why. Why don't we take behaviorism to the workplace? So I did. And of course, we only used a positive approach, positive reinforcement. We never talked about punishment. And we based that on the laws of operant behavior. No other laws in the social sciences, really, but we do have the laws of behavior. And then I developed this five-step model, you know, identify, measure, analyze, intervene, evaluate. We took that all over the place and uh, got some amazing results in the real world. And specifically, this is one kind of clean looking example here that we did at a Frito-Lay plant up in uh, Omaha. And uh, in this Frito-Lay plant, we had the industrial engineers measuring productivity and we randomly assign experimental and control groups on our training intervention on that five-step model that I just ticked off. And in that five-step model, wow, you know, productivity went up on that treatment group. No difference in the pre-intervention pre there, but this was record performance in the history of this plant. Record performance during the intervention that we received out of these this uh, group of nine, nine departments. And then, of course, it continued until we then did all of our OVMOD studies into an AMJ meta-analysis, which was pretty pioneering at the time, 1997, where all of our studies showed that we had an overall effect on manufacturing because it was easier to identify performance behaviors we got a 33% improvement in performance on the overall, but look at this. Just feedback alone did as well as financial incentives on the intervention side. And then on the service side, you know, not as high, but still very significant improvement in performance. But look at here, the social, which was just recognition and attention, was just as high as using money again for incentives on those performance behaviors. So when we hit this meta-analysis in AMG, I just felt, well, that, I'm putting that one to bed. I got to look at something else now in my career. So I did. And of course, that's where I turned to the positive psych stuff after the real managers in the 80s, and then now turned to positive psychology and psychological capital. So you can see here, you know, positive psychology coming down in 1999 for me at the first summit in Lincoln, Nebraska, that then moved to Omaha, and now the headquarters is in D.C. But that was uh, certainly an input into me. And then, of course, like I said, taking that to the literature to brand that, I took it to first, uh, I had one in the Academy Man Management Executive, and why that? Because, frankly, I could get it in sooner, you know, AMR, I would have worked on this for years probably, but I got it into AME, and guess what? That goes to all Academy members. <laughs> so that was my strategy. Everybody got one. And then I did the same then with my two sons. We coined the term as well, psychological capital in 2004. So that's what we then did out of that POB stuff, just first a JOB article and an AME article that then led to our kind of the application side of positive organizational behavior, which I called psychological capital. And again, Bruce, uh, Bruce had uh, input into all that as well, but my two sons and myself did the article on, on uh, psychological capital. Carolyn Yusuf also, of course, was involved in this as well. So anyway, that's kind of the back, background there and the, you know, the two flows of the research streams and they just kind of had a confluence of positive psychology and my POB to lead to PSYCAP. 
So, based on that, I did have this take this scientific approach, you know, because there's a lot of you know a lot of buzzword stuff, a lot of soft stuff in the positive stuff, but not in positive psychology. Martin Seligman is a research psychologist, okay? So I wanted to follow positive psychology because they had that research tradition, you see. And so I, my approach and why I base it on positive psychology again is because they did do the, you know, did all the bells and whistles to do this right. And so all those people in positive psychology were scientifically oriented and did, a, I think, a great job of building that whole field. Now, that isn't to say that there isn't still, you know, criticisms of positivity, because obviously there are. And the criticisms, I think, why I didn't get it 10 years ago, this award, you know, well, Fred's just doing this positive stuff, you know, what, you know, that really doesn't matter. But again, the, the critics, like this Barbara Endrich, who wrote a best-selling book called Brightsided, and she, she frankly got tired of people telling her how lucky she was because she had cancer. She said, I, I object to this. You know, so she just wrote this book that she got brightsided, and of course she looks real positive there. <laughs> but anyway, Barbara wrote this best-selling book, and then of course we have people who just feel that anybody who's you know, doing all these emojis on their toes or whatever are lazy and unmotivated. So that's you know, somewhat conventional wisdom, that positivity is pretty much of a joke. But again, I will admit that we have to use the, you know, the qualifier of realistic positivity, not just positivity per se, which of course a lot of the airport books depend upon. So most everybody, and I say most everybody, of course there are holdouts here about the value of positivity, but I think most people believe that happiness, positivity is great, but again, too fuzzy to take seriously for academic research. Too many balloons, too many smile faces, too many emojis. And now I really believe we have a science of positive psychology and psychological capital. Now remember, I, I'm receiving this award, which I'm very thankful for, but I also got an award from the Harvard Medical School last year on my contributions. So, I mean, I think that's pretty scientific. <laughs> okay, drawing from positive psychology research in the published top psychology journals then, we now know where positivity comes from, we now know how to develop it, and thirdly, we know that it has desirable impact and that the value, positivity definitely has value. Now, we do know that positive psychology has demonstrated the value of positivity over negativity. Now, again, negativity is recognized. You know, we have to have, all they're asking for is a little bit more balance. <clears throat> but not all positive. You know, we're not saying that everything should be positive. That's not, that's not realistic. So I love the analogy that Barb Fredrickson uses for the sailing yacht example. So as you can see in this sailing ship here, the mast is quite tall and everybody kind of focuses on the mast, right? Because that's the wind behind our sails, that's what drives us, that's our motivation. But underneath is the keel and the keel represents negativity. The keel represents that you have to have a keel in order to steer that ship and or otherwise it'll just flop over and uh, that's as necessary, but again, the ratio is positive over negative, much higher on the positive. So we need, you know, we believe that bad moods, you know, are real. They play a role. Being sad is real. Corrective feedback, not in-your-face harassment, <laughs> we don't ever endorse, but we do believe that people should be told when things are not right and so forth, give corrective feedback. So they all play still an important role, but we need more positive. More positive over negative. Now Barbara got into some trouble methodologically with trying to put a number on that. She said three to one in the workplace, but then it was found out that the methods she was using from a, from a mathematician were not correct. So she backed off of that, but the point is everyone would agree 
that you need more positive than negative, okay? Now, where does uh, happiness and positivity come from? So that's, of course, the big, uh, big question. And I love what Sonia Lubomirsky has put together, a research psychologist at University of California, Riverside. And Sonia put together this circle, famous all positive psychology people know about this. And what she did is she took all the studies, and that includes you know, meta-analyses in JPSP and so forth, and she found that about half of our positivity, half of our happiness, comes from nature and nurture. So it does, you know, heredity does matter. And so does how you were raised, the nurture part, okay? So nature and nurture, in fact, this is sometimes referred to as the hedonic treadmill. You got this set point, which is half of what, you know, your positivity is all about. You always kind of return to that. You can't get off the treadmill of the fact is that you are, you know, the heredity and the nature and nurture. So, but look at this, circumstances only 10%. Now, most of us, including, of course, the person on the street would say, oh, the circumstances determine our level of positivity. Not so. Study after study has found that our level of income doesn't matter that much. It matters a little, don't, don't get me wrong again. But the key is, in fact, they always, they recently put in, in U.S. dollar terms, about 50000 If you make 50000 you make more than that, it doesn't make you any happier. So if you make less than 50000 yeah, you're not so happy if you can't get, you know, your enough food and, and shelter and so forth. But the same is true for where, we, where you live. It doesn't matter that much. You know, people always ask me, you've traveled the world, what's your favorite place, Fred? Uh, I always say, Hawaii. I love Hawaii, and so does my family. I said, but, uh, you know, I finally decided to bite the bullet. I'm going to go over there and teach for 10 weeks, which I did, in the, uh, in, in the University of Hawaii. And we were over there 10 weeks. We were all planned to stay on for two extra weeks. No, we went home as soon as classes were over. Why? Gee, we just couldn't take the sand in the kids' hair anymore. Went to the beach, got old after a while. We went back to Nebraska, you know, <laughs> over Hawaii. <clears throat> so, you know, location really doesn't matter that much, okay? The same is true for age. You know, we think, oh, the young people are so lucky because they're happy because they're young. No, not necessarily. Same with older people. Doesn't matter that much. Even the health that we have doesn't matter that much because people return to their set point and they return to how they want to determine their, ha their happiness and positivity. So that 40% is really key to what we're talking about. The intentional piece of positivity and happiness. So that 40% is self-determined, okay? So in particular, we know then that we draw our theoretical foundation from that intentional piece of positivity and happiness. That intentional piece is the mindful, you know, the mindful intentions that we have, best stated perhaps by old Abe Lincoln who said, most people are about as happy as they make up their minds to be. I love that quote. Now, whether you read it, really said that or not, but the point is that that's about as good as it gets in terms of, you know, people decide how happy they are, okay? So that mindfulness that comes from that 40%, the choices are the key. Our positivity, our mindset, our psych cap is up to us. And here's, a, of course, a Bandurian influence. We are both products, the 50%, as I told you, that, you know, heredity, nature, nature and nurture, but also the 10%, yeah, that matters too. So that's the majority, 60%. But we're also producers of our happiness. And that's where, of course, the 40% comes in. So that's about the theoretical foundation that we have. And, of course, we do have you know, whole articles on PSYCAP theory now. But if you remember, I base this primarily on social cognitive theory and Bandurian influence on me. He has always been, <laughs> I try to get in behind his wake. You know, is that, that's my strategy has always been. So then PSYCAP, 
just has taken off with the research and just all over the world. So when I say that, my proof of that is I'm on Google Alert for anything that has psychological capital in the title. I get five or six a week. Not from, not from all of our journals for sure, but around the world. It's just taking off. <clears throat> so here's what we mean by PSYCAP then. I'm going to try to differentiate it from the other types of capital that are out there starting with the economic financial capital, which of course is what most people associate capital with, okay? And that, of course, is what our business school is based on, <laughs> is this whole notion of financial capital. So my colleagues in finance, econ, you know, I tell them about what I'm doing, oh, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> that doesn't matter, <clears throat> okay? I agree, and that's very important, and I'm not putting it down. But there is also human capital. And of course, those of us in OB and HR, we, we love human capital. What our people know, what their education is, what their experience is. So we love you know, human capital, including me. But also now social capital, all the networking stuff that's going on, as well as so social media, which is just taking over. And then, of course, psychological capital. And I'm not saying that this is, you know, sequential, and I'm not saying that these are all, you know, you have to have one before the other, something like that. It's all just kind of how I'm differentiating the discriminant validity of PSYCAP versus the other types of capital. So we depend upon psychological resources to draw from and leverage. And of course, that's kind of like, you can use the analogy, Bruce has used this before, uh, money in the bank, you know, that you can draw from the money that you have in the bank. And it's not personality traits. Why? Because uh, I'll tell you why in a minute in terms of the criteria for, for what we mean by a resource. It's not attitudes, it's not strengths, it's not talents, it's not the cognitive, emotional, or cultural intelligence that are also in the literature. What it is, is the following. I have scientific criteria that I set up from the beginning, which is again, 1999. And the reason I did this was to try to differentiate it, especially from emotional intelligence, which is very popular at the time, but was also being criticized for their measures, criticized for their lack of theory. I like EI, believe me, and of course it's getting better all the time, and the measures are certainly getting better all the time. But I set up the following scientific criteria to be included in what I mean by psychological capital. Number one, it must be based on theory and research. Number two, it must have valid measurement in the published literature. Number three, it must be state-like, which means that it's open to development with some relative, and I say state-like, with some relative stability to it. And number four, it must have desirable impact. So in order to be PSYCAP, it has to meet those four criteria, okay? Now, I searched not the OB literature, but the positive psychology literature. Remember, that's what I'm drawing this all from. And in the positive psychology literature, which of their constructs best met these criteria? Number one, hope. I never saw hope in our literature in OB, but it's of course a big one in positive psychology, especially my friend, became friend, Rick Snyder at University of Kansas. He has a 500 page, uh, 500 page book on hope theory, you see? And I thought hope met this criteria very well. He has measures, he has impact, etc. He passed away, unfortunately, a few years ago. Efficacy, I was into. You know, I was already into efficacy with uh, Alex Stajkovic, one of my early students as well. And we, we did a lot of work on efficacy, had a psych bowl piece with over 3,000 citations. Uh, and I was into efficacy, so I loved that. And then the third one that met it, resiliency. And that, of course, is bouncing back and beyond and then a fourth one was optimism, positive attributions and future positive expectations. So those four met the criteria. 
And of course, I did not set it up this way. Honestly, I didn't even use this acronym until a few years that I was into this. Spells hero, <laughs> right? So the way to remember what is PSYCAP is H-E-R-O. And of course, the consultants love that one <laughs> for branding and all. So the hero within us and the other, you know, people say, what about courage? Doesn't meet my criteria. What about compassion? Doesn't meet my criteria. Sorry. Are they going to? Yeah, maybe. They have to, you know, have to prove it to me. But these are some of the ones that are out there right now that are, I love them all, but they don't, what, they're not what I call PSYCAP. And then, of course, we went from there to do the research, back up to all this. So as you can see, we've gone all different types of organizations all over the world in our research effort. So we have 3,000 requests for our measure, our validated measure from personnel psychology. We validated that in 2007. We have 3,000 requests. That means there's at least 3,000 studies going around the world on PSYCAP. And that's the people who bother to get permission to use the instrument, which is free for research, by the way. We also have done this with sales associates, bank employees, aerospace company, i.e. Boeing, I'll say who, entrepreneurs, insurance services, i.e. white collar, team level. Uh, Julie Broad over here is doing the team stuff right now in a lot of the government uh, agencies that Booz Allen Hamilton is, is into right now. Chinese IT firms, logistics firms, restaurant chains, wide cross-section of firms, mostly that. And then, of course, now we're moving into health, healthcare, education, and sports. We did a meta-analysis, published in HRDQ, won the award in the Academy of Human Resource Development. <laughs> published my work, as Ivana says, over 52,000 citations, uh, I-10 index of 2,000, uh, of 208, that's three ahead of Bruce, where is he, there he is, <laughs> three ahead of him, <laughs> no competition there, <laughs> and uh, our meta then consisted of 51 studies, not all ours of course, but a lot of ours, 12,000 uh, participants, with an average R of about 0.3, I say about because it depends on which segment we're using there, but performance is about 0.3. That's as good as it gets for performance, you know. Now, again, for the attitudes, much higher, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, not 0.7, because then we get into discriminant validity issues. But 0 0.6 with job satisfaction, 0 0.5 with commitment, et cetera. And then, of course, we also have related to well-being, which we're really taking off to now. Now, the very recent, post that meta-analysis, I have gathered together these studies all over the world in academic journals now again, and that I've mostly pulled off of my Google Alerts. So beside performance, satisfaction, commitment, organizational citizenship behavior, the higher the PSYCAP, the higher the well-being, meaningfulness, engagement, ethical climate, hardiness, humility, voice, safety, justice, trust, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. I've got dozens of these. The lower the substance abuse, especially now with the opioid addiction issue, which is just you know, taking off, the higher the psych cap, the lower those problems. The lower the you know, work-family conflict, depression, especially even versus use of meds and even cognitive behavioral therapy. Why? Cognitive behavioral therapy I love, but takes too long, takes a skilled therapist. We can do better with PSYCAP and get better, as good or better results. Burnout, emotional labor, stress, negative affect, incivility, turnover, absenteeism, et cetera, et cetera. So how do we develop PSYCAP? <clears throat> Through experimental published research, very few of that, including Solomon Four Group, we have that even for the causal relationship of developing PSYCAP is proven to be open to development. 
and also cause performance to improve with those experimental and logistical, uh, excuse me, longitudinal studies. And now, Wayne Cassio's area here, some utility analysis that I'll show you here next. And that particular is where we did this at the Boeing Corporation working on the 787, the biggest product in America we're using SiteCap development and training on. Here's the results of that. Wayne's formula, one of his formulas, <laughs> utility equals da-da-da, and I'm not going to go through with that with you, but we just then literally used the real data from Boeing into that utility analysis formula. <clears throat> we get a value added of $73,000, 74. We put it into in, uh, Finance 101 ROI, which is value added, 74, minus cost of the training, which we were very you know, conservative on, how much time away from the job these guys took for this two and a half hour training program workshop that we did over the cost of the training. That's, you know, again, Finance 101. We get 270% return on investment. Okay, <laughs> not bad. I show that to my finance colleagues. Well, you're making some robust assumptions there, Fred. I said, no, no more than you guys do. <laughs> the way you, you know, determine depreciation at all. So here you go, 270%. Oh, that got the attention of the practice community. Believe me, they know dollars and cents. This got our wedge into the strategic uh, HR uh, agenda and, and in corporations when they see that we can get that kind of return on the development or ROD as Bruce calls it. <laughs> and so of course there goes the billboards up for Fred all over the world you know talking about SiteCap and I happened to take this particular billboard they were all over when we were in, in Southeast Asia when I gave talks over there, but I like this one because there's Hero in the background. <laughs> and I also had, I said, well, I'm not going to come to Jakarta. It's too, too dangerous for me. Well, we'll give you a police escort, Fred. I love that, you know. <laughs> like a rock star, you know, over there. <clears throat> but again, it's because of the data. It's because that it, they can see the application, you see? So how do we do this? Well, first of all, it's not rocket science. It's the development process is not rocket science. And of course, we use workshops. We use online types of application, which is published in the, in the academic AMLE, actually. We have developing apps for the development of SiteCap. And of course, we're developing webinars, personally, on SiteCap. And of course, all, the, all these are amount to, as when I say it's not rocket science, is that we just have the leader trainers do their group skills better than I do, actually, and exercises to develop each of the HER components that mainly come from positive psychology. So positive psychology has, has developed this stuff for a number of years. We use simple tools, you know, simply shape how we interpret situations, you know, as simple as, you know, just interpret as glass half full, ask the question, is this an inconvenience or a tragedy? You'd be surprised how often that can come up and really defuse things and stress and all. We, we use the 40% self-development to develop realistic, hopeful, efficacious, resilient, optimistic, be a hero. Oh, no stigma on that. Everybody wants to bring out the hero in themselves. No stigma. Choose little simple things like I call the get positive, G-E-T, ritual that people should follow. G for gratitude. Make it a habit. Keep a log. Repeat it every night. How gratitude you, you know, how much gratitude you have. Do 30 minutes of the E exercise. The best medicine there is. Exercise. And T, spend time with, quality time with family and friends. Write a gratitude letter. 
not only induces positive states, but in, in others and in self. Sustainable development process. We build that foundation in this development process through webinars, through workshops, through the book, reading, reading about PSYCAP. We then have sustainability boosters after the training occurs. All the bells and whistles that are going on in modern training and sustainability. And then, of course, we try to make that self-reinforcing through support of leaders, team, and family. And then it comes full circle to help not only themselves, but their team members on their families on a contagion effect. We have proof of this that PSYCAP can be contagious. Taken off on all of these, you know, these are my <laughs> billboard of places that I have been doing PSYCAP. NASA with the Mars project, you know, not just the technology, but being in those capsules for three years. <laughs> they have to have something going on psychologically. Burger King, Harvard Med, etc. Shell's using it. The U.S. Army is using it. A lot of stuff Julie is doing with Homeland Security agencies, etc. Working on that 787. And now I just want to end up with where are we going with this in the future. And that is to build and continue to build the theory. That's the, you know, it's, it's more or less an, <laughs> an inductive rather than deductive approach that we've been doing with all this empirical research that we have. But we still need better theory building, no question about it. Research refinements, we're looking at alternate methods. Uh, Pete Harms is doing a lot of that with implicit measures. He's over there. And I'm lucky enough to come along with him. At Harvard, we're doing these uh, MRSs rather than functional MRIs, which are questionable. There's, you know, raising questionable measurement from the functional MRIs, but not with these MRSs that are just amazing. But, of course, you have to have big-time bucks to, to run uh, subjects through that. We're, we're working on levels of analysis, collective PSYCAP that Julia is actually working on, as well as O PSYCAP, organizational PSYCAP, and of course, qualitative methods, which Ivana is trying to talk me more and more into. And then, of course, other sustainable techniques and strategies. And then moving into new domains like healthcare. So let me just give you this model and then we're done and I have time for a couple of questions at least. So the new application at Harvard Med is PSYCAP in cancer patients. Now I'm, I'm at the point in my career, you understand, in, in the age that I want to try to really give back. And I frankly am a little burned out on the workplace because I feel I've done that, both with OBMOD and then now with PSYCAP. But let's, let's move on into things like cancer. So we know, for example, that 80% of those diagnosed with cancer are become depressed. I would be, I know that. So what do we do about it? Well, we found that, the, or we're proposing, that the higher the psych cap, there may be, and of course this will be the weakest relationship, but there may be relations with physical effects, mostly psychological effects, i.e. to help with depression, we've got studies on that already, PTSD, anxiety, etc. And then, of course, even mortality rates and suicide. So the higher the psych cap, we can help prevent some of these issues. And, of course, there are obviously moderators that have to be taken into account, the type of cancer, the stage they're in, whether it's at diagnosis, during treatment, or in rehab, and then, of course, if they have reoccurrence and all that. So those all, of course, will come into the picture. But so far, at least, we have empirical data to show the impact of PSYCAP on cancer and AIDS patients, deployed soldiers, and EAPs. So, for example, we have separate studies, not overall PSYCAP, but in the literature, there are a lot of studies that show that the higher patients Hope is the lower their depression, the higher their efficacy, the higher their resilience, the higher their optimism, the lower their depression and anxiety. That, that is in the literature right now. And we also have a big, huge study out of Harvard where they have, you know, one of those big, big data studies where they found that 
the, this particular database is nurses over the last, I think it's 40 years, they have found that those who are optimistic in their measures have a 13% less likely to, to die from cancer, the optimists in this huge database. Very significant, you know, from a statistical standpoint. And we do have direct then studies that the higher the site cap of HIV AIDS patients, negative relates to depression and addictions. So the higher their site cap, the lower their depression and the lower they're addicted to drugs and uh, opioids. And then of course, there's what Julie is working on primarily and Peter did before, uh, the site cap of soldiers and Paul Lester, one of our for Bruce, Bruce's former students has done a lot of work in the military on this as well. Site cap of soldiers negatively relates to their post-deployment PTSD, depression and addictions. So uh, Paul and Dina and Peter have a study uh, published in our journal Leadership and Organization Studies on this very topic. And again, I want to emphasize no stigma. People just, you know, they want, they, they love the positive approach here. They love the, you know, to become a hero. And that's why EAPs are picking this up. So I gave a webinar just a month ago to all the professional association of EAP directors across the country. So that's where we're going with this stuff. It's pretty darn exciting to me, even at this age, I feel it's important to do some of this, you know, outreach that we're doing with PSYCAP. So, positivity in this search, this career search, positivity in general and PSYCAP in particular, we can be on top of the world and May the site cap force be with you. Thank you. Uh, any questions? I, I think we got a couple of minutes, maybe, Mary. I know you run a tight ship. <laughs> any questions on anything I've said or didn't say? Anything at all? Yes, sir. Absolutely. There's always going to be some, you know, some moderator involved in that. But of course, we have many studies in China, including, I, I know the Chinese have taken off with PSYCAP. That's part of the, I mean, it's a huge phenomena in China right now. But also our own studies have shown that the higher the PSYCAP, the better the results that we have on Chinese uh, participants in our studies. So we have not found a big difference but maybe some of the Chinese scholars are, are finding difference. I don't know. Anything else? But culture always matters. I'm not denying that. Anything else? Going once. <laughs> Go ahead. Correct. I love that, and thanks for calling that out, because I think there's a whole thing that we have to get a better handle on, with especially millennials, with the role that gaming can play in sustainability. So I think that we're personally working on some gamification techniques to keep people engaged in PSYCAP after they have gone through our training, after they've attended a webinar. So I think there's a whole big area that, you know, I know a lot of you are into, and some of you are now doing academic programs on gaming and all, but gamification has a huge impact, as has been shown in the airline industry, the hotel industry, it can also be, though, uh, ways to sustain our training, which has always been a big bugaboo for us. How do we sustain this stuff? So I, I'm glad you picked that up, because that's what we're trying to do. 
Anything else? And I notice you're fairly young. <laughs> Anything else? That's it? Mary? Okay, thanks again, everyone. Thank you.